I'm B.L. Ackman, and I have the great pleasure of being here today with Dr. J.T. Kosman, who is one of the leading experts on the planet in applied artificial intelligence technology and practice. I have a million questions for you, <laughs> and I know that everybody watching wants to know this information too, and it's hard to find it. I have heard you speak, and you are just so clear, which is why I was so excited to be able to interview you. Tell me a little bit about some of the successful campaigns that you've been involved in related to AI. Oh, uh, sure. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I've been looking forward to the conversation. I have one of the more eclectic careers, I think, in artificial intelligence and in data science in general. Until recently, I was the chief data officer for Time, Inc., one of the world's leading publishers. Before that, I was chief data scientist for Samsung. And before that, I did a lot of work with the U.S. Intelligence, Defense, and Security Agencies. Also did a side project uh, you might have heard of where we did the social media strategy for the 2012 Obama campaign. And so, yeah, I've been involved in, gosh, I don't, we didn't know where to start on all the projects in particular areas we've been working on, my team and I, for quite some time now. What role did artificial intelligence or data play in the Obama campaign? Because it certainly was wildly successful. President Obama really very genuinely just wanted to understand the constituencies. And not a constituency singular, but plural. It's a big believer that there are a plurality of opinions, of perspectives, of belief systems out there. And he wanted to know what people actually thought about various issues. And so rather than saying the mood about the economy or guns or whatever else it was, was unidimensional, he wanted to look at, so what are these groups saying and what are those groups saying? So that genuinely he could better be able to speak to what their concerns were and what their issues were. We essentially listened to, we used to jokingly refer to it as the social media multiverse. We would listen to, rather than relying on just polls and surveys and focus groups and, and that attributional research that, frankly, if the last election told us anything, it's that not 100% reliable and people tend to lie and, and misrepresent or, or don't even know. And so we would listen to the conversations they were having in the open forum, and we would listen to these truly billions and billions of conversations that were occurring simultaneously, and we would use a combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing to parse through all these conversations and be able to speak to what those various groups were interested in. How were you monitoring the conversations? What were you using to do that? We were using uh, wholly open source. So we made a great point at the time of using what, in my day job working for the intelligence community, we refer to as OSINT, open source intelligence. And so that's what people are tweeting or what people are making comments on YouTube videos or open Facebook pages. And we very purposely never went behind the veil. So we weren't looking at, at what people were having in these private or discrete conversations among themselves. My basic philosophy on doing this sort of work is nobody wants to be listened in on, but everybody wants to be heard. And we live in a world that's grown so large and so fragmented and so tribalized in so many ways that I think people's greatest concern is, is that sort of, I don't know, impotent outrage you feel at shouting at the television set and nobody can hear you. And so when they would shout at their screen or type at their screen, we would hear them and we would distill those comments and bring them to the attention of the president. That does not appear to be happening anymore. Even if it were, you have to have three players in it, right? There's the sender, the receiver, and the communication channel. And if you don't want to receive a message, <laughs> and there you go. Let's talk a little bit about AI in general. Tell me, who are the key players? Who's the most advanced at this point? Is Google ahead of Microsoft? Is Microsoft ahead of yeah. IBM? Who, who's in charge? That's the wonderful thing about AI right now is there is no one who is the sole dominant player. All the FANG companies are playing heavily in the space. You have Facebook, Apple, Alibaba, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft. All these folks are playing, and, and the wonderful thing about it is we have gotten past that notion of these little, 
I don't know, tribalized factions who used to play in these areas. In the early days of software development, in the early days of computer, you'd see this group or that, but the open source ethos has really come to dominate in artificial intelligence. The only equivalent we've had before this was the Human Genome Project, when we finally broke down the barriers between research institutions and started to just publish broadly and share among scientists and practitioners. I'm thrilled that I'm part of a group right now. I just got back from Australia where I was in Melbourne and Sydney with people who I work with as routinely as my colleagues in Silicon Valley. And I was there a few weeks before. All these places, it's like old home week uh, because of the, the channels, the conduits, the mechanisms, and just this spirit of sharing and collaboration and openness. We all want to, to help one another and to help forward the field. Dave Copeland at, at, Copeland at uh, Microsoft in the UK said AI is the most important technology anybody's working on in the world right now. Is that true? Absolutely. Inarguably. And it's, it's not because I'm working at it and I have, have this natural bias, but when you look at how fundamentally it's going to impact and is already impacting every industry, every sector, everything, and it's ubiquity, it's generalizability, it's applicability into every area of our life from healthcare to marketing to logistics and manufacturing, there's absolutely nothing that it won't touch. I absolutely am convinced that AI will have a bigger impact on our economy than electricity did. My goodness. And it's virtually invisible, basically. I mean, those of us who are being studied don't know it. Those of us, when you use your healthcare system or whatever, you're not really aware of the fact that AI is involved. It's just like, is this convenient or is it not? Is it helping me get what I want to get or not? So it's sort of a background thing, which a little bit is scary. Well, I prefer to think of it as those of us who are being served. And Really, that's what AI is about. It's got that same ubiquity as electricity. When I ask people, where does electricity come from? They point to the outlet on <laughs> And that's okay. That's how you should think of it. It's the same with driving your car. You don't necessarily have to know how to disassemble and reassemble a carburetor or even how we extract gasoline from fossil fuels to be able to drive your car. You're using AI every day, whether it's in your nav system or in Siri, or Alexa, or the recommendations you're getting when you're shopping on Amazon or watching a movie on Netflix, its ubiquity is its real value. And if we're successful, increasingly, you won't be aware of it. And I don't mean that surreptitiously. I mean, it will be one of those things that simply serves you and serves your needs. Seamlessly. Yeah, exactly. Frictionless. So given oh, all of that, it do Facebook and Twitter and Google and YouTube have enough data to be able to stop Russian interference at this point, to be able to measure who's hateful and who's a bot? Can they tell? And if they can, what's stopping them from doing it? That's a wonderful question. And it's a multi-part question. You know, the first question is, do they have enough data? Enough data is not a problem. By 2020, we will have 40 zettabytes of data available to researchers. Just to put that in context, if you took every grain of sand on planet Earth, multiplied it by 75, that's 40 zettabytes. So we've got Good Lord, that's crazy. Facebook has got a lot of that data and a lot of it accessible to them. What you're really talking about is will. You have to ask yourself, if Facebook is able to, with few impressions, with few inputs, recommend a product, service, or even proffer an advertisement to you that perfectly suits your needs. And so then it's a matter of making decisions. You would probably add for cosmetics that probably I wouldn't get, or for handbags or shoes that hopefully I'm not getting the same ads. And so if they are able to do that, to be able to offer you political advertisements that might more likely resonate with you is a decision that's being made. And what's bothering me about all this frankly, is abrogating the responsibility to have owned that you're making those decisions. Whether you're making them overtly or just tacitly, or simply allowing them, those are decisions that are being made. It's what my Catholic friends refer to as sins of omission. Right? Well, it does seem that way. I mean, it absolutely seems that Mark Zuckerberg really doesn't want to take hold of what he's got. 
Twitter and Google and YouTube are not too far behind and they're not taking control of what they've got situations. So if I hear you correctly, you're saying if they wanted to, they could. Of course, they absolutely could. It's in direct conflict with their profit motive. I have a great deal of respect for Facebook and Twitter and some of the things they've done. But at the end of the day, and I hate to deride them, but these are parasitic providers. In essence, what they're doing is they're repurposing content that's created by others. So when I was at Time Inc., we spent an inordinate amount of money on cultivating and creating this premium content that these other entities are profiting from, which is fine. There's a model that currently exists that allows them to do that, and that's what the market's about. They should do that. But you don't get to abrogate your responsibility in doing that. At Time Inc., if I put in ads that were paid for by uh, the KGB, the FSB, I would have been held to task. And not just my role as the chief data officer, but sitting on the XCOM for Time Inc., we would have been held accountable and should have been. I don't think just because you're acting in this odd niche in the market, you get to pretend as if you no longer have a responsibility to the market. Well, I, I think that's a very interesting point of view, and I think that a lot of people seem to be afraid to say that. <laughs> but, I have few fears. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to marketing and how AI is impacting marketing and marketing, although that really was marketing. Among the colorful quotes I found when I was researching for this interview was you saying, knowing your audiences doesn't mean stereotyping them into gross, meaningless aggregations like moms, Minnesotans, or millennials. I swear if I hear one more CMO tacitly treating everyone from 18 to 29 as if they're somehow the same, I'm going to give someone such a smack. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm, uh, I actually made exactly that same threat live. Uh, I'm a pretty big guy, and I'm a former Special Forces soldier, so I I'll give you a smack if I have to. <laughs> it, what bothers me about that is, um, imagine a circumstance where there is an entity, an agency, and when we tend to talk about uh, the large city police departments, we talk about LAPD, NYPD, and we talk about this thing we call profiling. And it's a horrible practice right? And what are we doing? We're effectively treating everybody as if they're the same. Because they're of the same ethnicity, nationality, gender, whatever else it is, if you're Black or if you're Hispanic, we treat you differently. We treat you a certain way because of those superficiality. We don't care who you are. We care what you are. And that offends me, frankly. And when you do that under the guise of marketing, I find it no less offensive. And so for me to say, because you happen to be 19 to 30 years old or, or from Minnesota or a, or a woman or a mom, to treat you that way because, well, we all know all women this. All, I don't know how you win that sentence humanely, respectfully, decently. And so that's where I kind of come from and say, let's get rid of the cartoon caricatures, the silly superficial stereotypes, and give people the respect of treating them in a way that's concordant with who they really are. So how is AI going to make that more possible? I'll give you a quick example. But when we go back to the Obama campaign, think about listening to that social media multiverse. What if we were in a cafeteria instead? And there were a couple of billion people in the cafeteria, big cafeteria. And they're all having this, this sort of cacophony of conversations is occurring all across the cafeteria. What if we could somehow listen in and take all the people who were talking about pets and put them at this table and sports and put them at that table. And then the people who were talking about sports, they're talking about soccer, they're talking about American football, and they're talking about whatever else. Then we could even see what the dynamics are and the nature of those conversations are. Now we're getting to a point where we're really not just hearing people, we're really listening to people. We're, we're truly understanding who they are, where they're coming from. Marketers are not doing that? Well, and now we are. Now that's what AI is enabling us to do, because the problem is one of scale. So I'll give you the example, The Amazing Adventures of Adam. Adam is one of our customers. We know nothing about Adam except Adam's a him, and we know he's somewhere in his late 20s. Adam makes a couple of purchases that we become aware of. He buys pizza, beer, and some kind of sporting event. Every week, like a ticking metronome, pizza, beer, and sports, pizza, beer, and sports, pizza, beer, and sports. All of a sudden, that changes. Pizza, beer, and sports now becomes 
flowers, nice restaurants, and a cultural event. He met somebody. <laughs> well, I had a, flowers, nice restaurant, culture, all of a sudden. <laughs> and then after a year of that, he makes one purchase for two months salary at a jewelry store. I've given you almost no data about Adam, and yet we know quite a bit about him, right? Doing that at massive scale with instead of three to seven data points with millions and millions of data points, that's what machine learning, which is one of the main constituents of AI, gives us the ability to do. So how come I buy something and I see ads for that same something every day for the next month that I already bought? I'm not going to buy it again. Now that's called retargeting is the official name of it. That's one of the things that AI gets the blame for and we don't want the credit for. That's so <laughs> the stuff we're doing. Effectively, what is happening there is when you go to a website, they are implanting a cookie on your machine. And a cookie is really just... Uh, everyone talks about them sort of abstractly. It's just three little lines of code. It's a unique identifier and a date stamp, basically. And it says, you visited that website. Well, when you go to another website, they'll see you were there, and they'll serve you up another ad. You don't really need any machine learning or AI or any advanced anything for that. Google and whoever your browser is, and some of these other companies who you're visiting are profiting extraordinarily from that. We engage in an unstated quid pro quo with the search engines and with the online services. Why does it not cost 50 bucks to do a Google search? Well, because you agree to get ads served up to you, and that seems a pretty good deal to most people. And it, it is a good deal. I mean, I would rather that I get ads served than have to pay 50 bucks. Well, and you get Gmail, and you get YouTube, and you get, you know, enterprise suites. It all comes at a price. There is no free lunch. Everything costs you, and what it costs you is the willingness to be able to get advertisements. Well, what AI is doing is giving us an opportunity to change that from an intrusion to an opportunity. See, I have a philosophy that people actually love advertising. I had this conversation with my wife once, and she was sitting on the couch at the time, and she's reading, and she says, oh, not me. I hate ads at all times, always. I said, what's that you're reading? Oh, that's a catalog. <laughs> That's, it's a magazine without magazine. It's just ads. If it's the right ad for the right person, for the right time, for the right product service experience, it's an opportunity for us. What AI, machine learning, natural language processing, what we're getting better at is being able to serve up to you those things that you're more interested in. Why? It's more cost effective for the advertiser. You're happier. Everybody wins from the circumstance. If you were going to go on vacation, and all of a sudden you got an ad for 80% off that same vacation you're already planning on. That's not an ad anymore. That's a wonderful opportunity. When John Wanamaker said, if I, I'd get rid of half my advertising if I knew which half, now we'd know. And that's exactly right. We're answering Wanamaker's dilemma. Half my advertising dollars are wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. Why not? You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. There was an ad, uh, a cartoon rather, in the New Yorker many years ago. You'll probably remember it. 1994. It was two dogs sitting at a computer, and one says to the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. I love that cartoon. <laughs> All my work was predicated on saying, why don't we know if it's a dog? Why don't we know what breed of dog, if its tail is wagging, and if its nose is wet? <laughs> my work has largely been around trying to solve that problem, and figure that out, who's on the other side of that screen, and how do we know what it is they want, need, desire, or interested in? You have said that on behalf of all your ostensible customers, let me be the one to say it out loud, that undifferentiated crap is a waste of time and money, and it turns out it turns people off. It's just spray and pray. And so that there's really no excuse for that anymore. That's exactly right. It's laziness, and I think it's disrespectful, candidly. I think serving up those ads to you that just take away from you the... The one thing we have in life, as I'm getting older, you know, you realize that it isn't the ephemera of stuff. It's the one thing we have is our time, is who we are. And to, for me to steal that from you is, is wholly disrespectful of you. It's one of my personal predilections. I'm always on time, always. Why? Because when I was a young man, I used to be late for appointments and someone sat me down and explained to me, what you're really saying is you can't manage time. You can only manage priority. So effectively, you're telling people, I don't prioritize you. I don't respect you. 
And I think that's what advertisers are saying when they are taking away your time by rather than doing that to be able to give you something that could actually enrich, enhance, better and improve your life. Why not do that? Well, that brings me to my next question. Is there enough reliance on data by marketers? And are they looking at the right data? Why is this sort of thing still happening? It astounds me. There was a front page article in Ad Age about a year and a half, two years ago. The title of the article was, Why are CMOs dropping like flies? And the average tenure for a CMO has reached all time low. Oh my goodness. It's yeah, more ephemeral now than, than a fruit fly. And gee, I wonder why. Well, really? You wonder why? You wonder why you're effectively just taking a massive budget and just throwing it up in the air and hoping something sticks. Shame on you. Shame on you. The tools, the abilities exist for you to be able to do these things right. Do them right. So what skills do communications professionals need to have to make the best use of AI? And, and which professionals should have that? I mean, is it all of us? The answer lies in symbiotic relationships. No one is saying that CMOs or communication professionals or marketers need to get advanced degrees in mathematics or computer science or need to be able to do these sort of things. But on the other side of that, as I explain to my colleagues and peers and remind them, all of our successes are by proxy. I am not a marketer. I can't create a marketing campaign. All I can tell you is what will and won't resonate with whom and how effective it was. How does that differ from marketing? I guess it shouldn't. You know, the first marketer, and I argue that politics is a product like any other. And so the first one, I think, was Marcus Tullius Cicero, one of the great orators of all time. Cicero infamously once said, if you wish to persuade me, you must think my thoughts, feel my feelings, and speak my words. So we've known that for two and a half thousand years. So <laughs> where's the excuse? So why isn't a communication professional, why isn't an advertiser, why isn't a brand working with someone who can help you think their thoughts, feel their feelings, and speak those words, and then be able to help you engage in true experimentation? Gee, that campaign didn't work. When I was at Time Inc., without pointing fingers, we had a senior vice president who'd been there a very long time, and he was sending email marketing campaigns that had an open rate of a fraction of 1%, which is, wow, what a waste of time. And so my team came up with a new project, a new approach, and they said, we called it Project Elevate, E-L-E-V-H, which I thought was very cute. I had to put the number in there somewhere. But what we were saying was, what if, heaven forbid, instead of just sending one email to 100,000 people and seeing how effective it was, what if we did a test run with 5,000 people? And what if we tried five different subject lines under the premise that if they don't open the email, they're probably not going to read the offer and see which is most effective and not just globally, but with various groups. So we'll create these archetypes, these topologies, not predicated on those silly stereotypes, but people who were sports enthusiasts who were like the adventures of Adam, right? And so we find these people and we send it to them. And then we send it to this group and this and this and this. We had an increase of 1,037% almost overnight just to be able to take a data-driven marketing approach on this one. How long ago? Two years. Two years. So two years ago, there were companies not using A-B testing? Everyone was starting to use A-B testing or multivariate testing, mm. but are they using it as effectively as possible? Are you partnering with the scientists, the people who do this for a living? And I think what we find often is, I, I don't know if it's a matter of trying to cheap out or if it's Upton Sinclair once said, it's hard to convince a man or something what his living depends on is not understanding it. And I think coming in and telling people that there's a new, better, different way to do things. And so we show them A-B testing. Oh, okay, we'll do this. We'll try two different things. It, it's not as simple as that. So right now, it would behoove agencies in advertising, PR, and digital industries to have a data scientist involved if not on staff and i don't necessarily recommend you hire data scientists because an entire team you don't they don't work independently you're typically talking a team of five or six 
So you're talking about a couple of million dollars a year, but there's no reason you can't partner with, I think of it almost as an information Sherpa, as somebody who you can partner with, can give you some counsel, give you some guidance. In my humble opinion, it's nearly marketing malpractice to not take a data-driven approach to marketing once the tools are available. How you could put millions of dollars at risk in marketing advertising campaigns for all but the smallest companies, and even in the smallest companies, marketing always represents a very significant portion of budget. How you can put that at risk without even making a phone call. I've actually told people, I'm by training, I'm a data scientist, a mathematician, and a psychologist. And I've told them, I think I'm the only doctor left who still makes house calls. I would rather, I'll talk to you for free. Call me. Let's at least talk it through and talk about what it is you're doing rather than just go blindly into the dark and wasting your money. You're courting not just Wanamaker's dilemma. That would have been bad enough. At least Wanamaker knew half his dollars were wasted and just half. Most organizations are probably wasting 90, 95% of their budget. And that's no exaggeration. You're speaking to such a small fraction of people in a way that will resonate with respond with them and they will respond to, why not shift a small, small portion of that to spend time with an expert? Well, given that offer that you just made, how do we get in touch with you? You can link to me on LinkedIn. You can email me directly. My email is my name, JT Kostman, J-T-K-O-S-T-M-A-N at gmail.com. I'm always happy to talk to just about anybody about these things. I'm, if you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. I'm curious because my nieces and nephews are, you know, choosing their college careers. Uh, what should you be studying now? I have a standing offer where I hold open office hours on Fridays for kids. Anyone who's thinking about going into this arena, anyone who wants to advance their careers or is thinking about a college major or those things, to have a chat with them. At the end of the day, H.G. Wells years ago said that for future generations, being statistically literate will be as important as reading and writing. In this day and age, if you can't code, Douglas Rushkoff wrote a book, Program Will Be Programmed, and it was just a polemic, but it was very well written. And in essence, he's say, what he's saying is right. Either you know how to code and you have a basic numeracy, understand math, or you're in a lot of trouble. I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> when I hire data scientists. Uh, I have a number of advanced degrees. I don't care about any of that. To me, I tell all my recruit. Oh, I don't work with recruiters, but I tell all my internal partners and my team, all I want are people who are passionately curious, numerate technophiles, who are wicked smart and work well with others. That's it. Those six criteria and you're good to go. And by the way, the people who think they're not numerate are wrong. Humans are as much numerate as we are bipedal. We're born with it. We can't help it. We are naturally numerate beings. It's just bred out of us by bad teaching. I would agree with that. That's definite. Anyone can learn to be, to understand the stuff we do. I routinely win bar bets by proving that you can learn transductive support vector machines in the time it takes you to finish a beer or a cup of coffee. My granddaughter at 10 years old can explain most of these concepts to you. Not just understands them, she could explain them to you. So how do kids reach you on Friday afternoon? What if a kid wants to talk to you? Uh, I routinely post on LinkedIn. Tell them to join me, follow me on LinkedIn. I accept any kids, all, all invitations to join me. I will routinely post a link to my calendar and they just, they don't even have to ask. They just go on calendar at time and it's always on Fridays and I'll block open usually the entire morning from eight to like noon, one o'clock in the afternoon and book these 50 minute sessions. Yeah, Friday, I had four of them this last Friday and that was just getting back from Australia. I you tried. are remarkably generous. And that is something that I think a lot of people hide behind is, you know, just trying to sound uh, unintelligible. I really often feel like that's being done intentionally, but I know that two kids are going to be getting in touch with you. That's exactly, and you know what? That's ex You're exactly right. Einstein once said, if you truly understand something, you should be able to explain it to your grandmother. And I think that is so true. I was on a call this morning with one of the biggest firms in the world, 
and they were talking about bringing someone in to explain blockchain and Bitcoin, and they didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And so I told him, do you have five minutes? I'll explain this. Oh, please explain. It's not that complicated. And so I walked him through blockchain. And we hide behind the jargon and the, the nonsense. You know, I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. And in one of the Sherlock Holmes novels, Sherlock Holmes explains to, to the client how he did what he did. And the clients, oh, now that you explain it like that, it's so simple. So Holmes turns to Watson and he says, I begin to think, Watson, that I make the mistake in explaining myself. Omne ignotum pro magnifico, you know, and my poor little reputation, such as it is, will suffer shipwreck if I continue to be so candid. Omne ignotum pro magnifico is Latin. It means that which is unknown is held to be magnificent. So it's <laughs> if you're the, the magician and you tell them what's behind the curtain, you're not magic anymore. Now you're just a huckster. And so <laughs> find a lot of that same thing with mathematicians, with technicians, with business folks, with supposed experts who feel like if I tell you how simple this is, which to me, when I hear simple, I think elegant. If I tell you how elegant this is, you're going to think I'm not all that smart because <laughs> you can understand it. If you can understand it, how smart can I be? <laughs> That's <just> great. <laughs> That's great. I thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And, and with you. And you have them contact me, please. I will. I will definitely do that. Thank you.